Hi everyone, I'm Chris and welcome back to this machine learning course. This final section of Deep Neural Networks considers a famous regularization technique, dropout. The idea behind dropout is related to our brain. Our brain is very robust and fault tolerant. On the one hand, it can process fuzzy information as input, for instance, a small distortion of the visual information or a small part of these informations missing is usually not important to grasp the content. So it does not rely on a specific information detail in the input. On the other hand, the brain doesn't rely on a specific neuron or single connection for a desired output either. This makes our brain very robust against small distortions. The idea is to imitate this in artificial neural networks by dropping randomly neurons during the training process. Then it cannot rely on a specific neuron and needs robust and redundant options to give the desired output. The most popular implementation of the dropout technique is the inverted dropout. In this algorithm, at first, a probability to keep a neuron of the neural network is specified. This so-called keep probability is the chance that a neuron is not dropped in the current training iteration step. So in each iteration step, the neurons are considered one by one. And each neuron is kept for the training step with this keep probability. For example, the key probability is 80%. That means a neuron is dropped with a chance of 20%. So on average, about 20% of the neurons will be dropped at random for an iteration step. The key probability can be chosen individually for each neuron layer. Usually, the output neurons have a 100% key probability to match the target values. So dropout is applied to hidden layers only. The dropout is usually applied during training only and not when the trained neural network is applied to new data to estimate an unknown target value. This is because randomly dropping out neurons while applying the neural network to data give unstable predictions. The neural network output varies slightly depending on the neurons dropped. Of course, we can do multiple forward passes for each input with different neurons randomly dropped and average the output. But this process is very computationally intensive. Therefore, it is better to use dropout during the training only. This application of dropout is called inverted dropout. If a neuron is chosen to be dropped, its weights are set to zero. In the example on the right side, we have chosen a 50% key probability. The neurons 1, 4 and 5 were selected to be dropped in the current training step. This is done by setting the connecting weights to other neurons to zero. Here these are W1, W4 and W5. But setting these weights to zero reduces the number of terms which are aggregated by the summation function z superscript 1. Three of the six terms of the linear combinations with the weights are zero when the dropout is used. But at test time, when the neural network is applied to data, all terms are taken into account. Then the magnitude is much larger compared to the time when the network was trained. To compensate this, the summation z superscript 1 is scaled in the training. Scaling z superscript 1 in the training process by the inverse of the key probability will compensate the reduction of neurons during the dropout. So for example, the summation is scaled by a factor of 2 to compensate the 50% dropped out neurons. The dropout technique regularizes the neural network and makes its predictions more robust. 
if there is a certain chance that the neuron is not present in the training step, the network's output should not rely too much on a specific neuron. In other words, the output should not be too sensitive to a specific neuron and its weights. Therefore, Dropout prefers smaller weight values and more equally distributed responsibilities for the outputted values. So, the effect seems similar to the regularization techniques discussed in the regularization section. For example, we can apply early stopping as well. This stops the gradient-based minimization before the minimum is reached. Another possibility is to use L1 and L2 regularization. As a reminder, the L1 and L2 regularization modify the cost function by another term. For L1 regularization, this term is the sum over all absolute values of all multiplicative weight parameters W. So the summation is over all layers and within the layer over all connecting multiplicative weights. Similarly, L2 regularization works. But instead of the absolute values of the weights, squared weight parameters are taken into account. Note that similar to the L1 and L2 regularization in linear regression, the bias term is usually not considered here. If you want to learn more about L1 and L2 regularization and the difference between them, please take a look on the regularization section of linear regression. In general, regularization tries to prevent overfitting by restricting the coefficients. Section finished. Thank you very much for listening. If you like this video, please click the like button and consider to subscribe this channel. If you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment down below.